It's time for Money for Lunch, where we feed your brain and your business with supersized portions of business and financial news. Now your host, Bert Martinez. All right, welcome to Money for Lunch. Hey, is this the first day of February? No, it's the last day of January. Now, here's what's sad. Statistically speaking, 90%, 95% of us have given up on our New Year's resolution slash goals. Now, there's several reasons for this. One, we've already forgotten. And what happens to make us forget, and this sounds kind of, you know, dumb, right? How could you forget an important goal? Uh, by the way, I'm still getting over my cold. <coughs> and uh, so from time to time, I may have to hit the pause button, so to speak, to cough. I was not able to do it at that instant. But anyway, so back to why as humans do we forget these sometimes very important decisions that we've made, right? These commitments. Well, you know what? It is strange that we forget these things, but it is one of our human frailties. We forget birthdays. My goodness, we forget anniversaries. I know people who've forgotten Hanukkah, Passover, Christmas, right? Listen, if you can forget your anniversary, you can forget just about anything. Important dates like showing up to court on time. How many people have forgotten a court date? Right? And this is crucially important. So, if you have forgotten your goals, no bother, no worry, not a big deal. Go and find them. If you don't if you can't find them where you've written them down, then write them down again. Put them in your car, put them on your phone, put them you know, I like to use a dry eraser and write them on the mirror in my bathroom. I also hang it up in my toilet room, toilet closet, the loo, I don't know. So I put my goals, I have door hangers, and I put my goals on door hangers all over through the house. I constantly re look at my goals. For several reasons, I want to be reminded, I want to avoid distraction, and I want to make sure it's still relevant, right? Because what happens sometimes is we may accomplish a goal, and so it's good to be able to scratch it off and celebrate. Or we've decided that goal is no longer relevant for whatever reason, right? Maybe you were training for a Spartan race, and... Maybe an injury occurred, so you're going to postpone it till next year, right? So it's no longer relevant. But having these goals in front of you is a great way to constantly keep you motivated, constantly remind you of this very important decision that you have committed to, right? I mean, because, look, the quality of your life is going to be based on your decisions and the commitments there too, right? And what's interesting is that I think that a lot of us struggle with making decisions. Uh, not too not too long ago, um, I did a video on decisions, right? And um, uh, you know, and so the importance of uh, of these uh, my the reason all of a sudden I'm stuttering is because you know uh, we use Google for some of our amazing uh, products, and uh, Google just decided to uh, throw me a uh, a curveball. So let's see if we can fix this. Uh, but anyway, so look. The ability of our, the quality of our lives is based on um, uh, 
the ability to stay on course, to be able to um, get things done, right? Sometimes we make a decision and we, like I said, we forget. We get discouraged, right? And sometimes, and this is, I think, happens quite regularly, we're afraid to make a decision because we don't want to make the wrong one. And I think making the wrong decision is better than making no decision because, look, if you make the wrong decision, you can quickly find out saying, hey, this is the wrong decision for me. And then you can decide to make a different decision. You can do a, a correction, right? All right. Well, I am excited uh, for our first guest. Speaking of decisions... Our first guest is Dr. Gleeb Sapersky, and his expertise comes from the academic research of these topics as a professor at Ohio State University in, get this, in the Decision Science Collaborative and History Department. He had learned well to speak to a broad audience about these matters as he runs an organization, <clears throat> Intentional Insights which popularizes science-based strategies for wise decision-making in emotional and social intelligence. He's a frequent sought-after consultant and a coach, as well as a speaker and a trainer in these topics in business venues. Dr. Gleeb Sapersky, welcome to Money for Lunch. Thank you so much, Bert. It's a pleasure to be here. and. I really hope you get that cold taken care of. I had a cold recently, <laughs> and it's not fun, especially for doing radio interviews. You know, oh, I do I like know. some. Yeah, I do something like maybe three a day, and yeah, that's cold is not a fun thing to do them <laughs> with. <laughs> not at all. Not at all. All right, so let's talk about this. Let's talk about how do you use science-based strategies for, let's say, decision making or for avoiding disasters in in, let's say, the business environment. Talk about that. Sure. So many folks think when they think about science-based decision-making, they think it's just cold, logical kind of reason, decision flow, process charts. Not true. Not true at all. So what the research on decision-making shows is that we are emotional creatures. About 70 to 80 percent of our decision-making comes from our emotions, from our intuitions. And the goal of effective decision-making, science-based decision-making, is to ensure that we combine our intuitions and our emotions with our reason, our heart with our mind, to make the wisest decisions that lead to our goals. So as you mentioned, you know, hanging up the goals for the house, I, I like that idea. We can talk about that. But that's a kind of an orientation toward what you're deciding. If you, you can't decide to have a certain goal if, let's say, you know, that's not a, in accordance with your values. So values, what you care about, which inform your goals, stem from emotions, stem from the things that motivate us, that push us toward our decisions. Then the reasoning part comes into how you will take the best path to get there. So that's kind of the combination of emotions and reason that leads you to make good decisions. Right. I like that. I like that. You know what? And I think that, again, and I said this earlier, that I think that sometimes we as, as a society, as human beings, are afraid to make a decision. We don't want to uh, look bad, right? We don't want to have, uh, mm -hmm. you know, people make fun of us or, or, or to fail. You know, these things go through our mind. And, you know, I've noticed many times before uh, you know, you you have a room of, let's say, I don't care, 5, 10, 20, 30 people, and somebody is asked to make a decision, a, a simple, you know, let's say a, a simple question, like, does anybody have a question? And nobody raises their hand. And then one person 
you know, finally makes the decision to raise her hand and ask a question, and all of a sudden, a flood of questions come <laughs> through, right? Everybody starts really, mm-hmm. so so now it's like, oh, oh, it's okay to ask questions. You know, and, and nobody nobody died or nobody made fun of the first question. <laughs> Let me ask my question. Do you find that a lot, that as humans we're afraid to make decisions? Yes. Uh, one of the typical mistakes, so there's a series of mistakes that people make in making decisions. These are called cognitive biases. For any of your listeners who want to look it up, up there's a nice list of them available on Wikipedia, over 100 of them. And cognitive biases are the systemic ways that our decisions go wrong. One of these cognitive biases has to do with forgetting that not making a decision, not taking an action, is an action. So you are choosing to not make a decision. You're choosing to not act. You know, by, let's say, not raising your hand in, uh, to ask a question, you're choosing to forego an opportunity to get more information. So you are also making a decision, but people forget that. It's not intuitive to our minds. That's kind of one of the systematic ways in which our emotions lead us astray because it's not emotionally comfortable to, as you said, have the potential of being made fun of or something like that or sounding stupid, but then you don't get the information that you need to make a good decision. So that is an important failure mode of our decision making. I see uh, it's also related to another flawed way of thinking, which is called the status quo bias. So that's kind of one of the cognitive biases, status quo bias. It's the failure mode of tending to keep on the course that we are. So not raising Mm. your hand, not making a change. This is the way that businesses often go wrong. And people in their personal finances and businesses, you know, when, I, when businesses bring me to consult uh, or leaders bring me in as an executive coach, this is often a common failure mode, not changing quickly enough, not taking action, not taking initiative, whether to raise your hand or to change a business policy or to fire an employee or to hire more employees. So that's kind of another failure mode that I see often and that really is highly problematic for people's ability to avoid disasters. Yeah, you know, and it's interesting, too. Now, I want to ask you this. With your work, um, um, do you find that um, that this, this failure mode, this apprehension that we have is uh, across the board, in other words, uh, executives have this apprehension, maybe not as much as as some other people, but you know, again, high level executives, um, you know, uh, soccer moms, uh, you know, working uh, class people, we all have, you know, some kind of fear when it comes to making a decision. Correct? Yes, we all have some fears, absolutely. So, and for CEOs, I would say that on the baseline, they do, they are more likely to make a decision quickly. Now, that doesn't, but that doesn't apply to all CEOs. It depends on which industry the CEO is in. If someone is in a quickly shifting industry, mm. they are more likely to make decisions more quickly. However, research shows that that's kind of a little bit counterintuitive, uh, that CEOs in quickly shifting industries the ones who tend to survive best are the ones who actually take more time to make slower decisions and consider all the implications because in quickly shifting industries with a lot of chaos and ambiguity, companies that jump first are usually not the ones that win. Usually the companies that win are the ones that look at the evidence of their four, the pioneers because many pioneers fail, and then they follow the pioneers that succeed. <laughs> so it's sometimes like it. not the best thing to be to make the decision quickly. It's sometimes best to let other people take the first blow, so to speak, and make the first mistakes and then learn from those mistakes. That's something I often advise people uh, when they bring me in to consult, not to 
put too much resources into a new project, kind of look at what others did, where it failed, what went wrong. There's a common, one of the common uh, biases, thinking errors, is called the planning fallacy. And the planning fallacy is the assumption that everything will go right. That's just how our mind works. When we go out for a meeting that's about 15 minutes away, we go out about 15 minutes before the meeting. And, you know, we forget that uh, sometimes there will be rush hour traffic or something like that, or we'll forget our briefcase or something like that, and we'll be late. So in the same way, you know, companies often underplan the amount of money and resources that a certain project will take and the kind of obstacles that they will face. And this not only goes for companies, this goes for governments very frequent. Uh, for example, the big dig in Boston, which went, I don't know, like 20,000, uh, which went something like 20 billion, when it was supposed to cost something like 1 billion or something like that. Uh, yeah, these are some something like the numbers that they're supposed to do. So you can see how much over budget uh, it went be because of unanticipated costs. So it's something wise to uh, address planning fallacy by doing research in advance, letting other people make the leap, and being the second goers, not the pioneers. <laughs> yeah, what's the saying? Uh, there's a saying that um, uh, that. Uh, Pioneers get slaughtered, and the settlers get rich. Something like that, right? Because it's the it's the second group of people that that really um, that that really thrive in the new environment because uh, the pioneers got slaughtered. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, and, and it's sometimes that way in business as well, right? Um, yes. Yeah, you know, you you know that um, I remember for a good example of this is Sony. Look at Sony. Sony. I think uh, was one of the pioneers where it came to uh, the MP3 player, mm -hmm. and uh, they came in. Uh, they were struggling in the marketplace, and then um, Apple came in with their uh, iPad, iPod. I'm sorry, iPod, and really took over the market. Mm -hmm. and, and I think the reason, I mean, and, 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 and some of that it goes to marketing because MP3. Nobody knew what, you know, not too many people knew what an MP3 player was. And, and uh, what do you call it, Apple was able to come in and say, hey, a thousand of your favorite songs in your pocket, everybody understood that. And all of a sudden yeah. people were buying these MP3 players, and it was too late. Apple already taken a bunch of the market. You know, and, and something – that you brought up that really uh, reminded me of this thing uh, that happened with Blockbuster. You mentioned about the status quo, what is it, status quo biases? Status quo bias, yes, oh, exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so, you know, here's, here's Blockbuster Video or Blockbuster Entertainment, and they had like over 4,000 stores. They're the biggest rental uh, provider in the world, right? the biggest mm -hmm. in the world, and Netflix comes to them and says, hey, let's partner up. I, you know, We have this idea. We're going to rule the world with uh, on-demand videos, and the uh, CEO uh, and, and the smart people there at Blockbuster said, no, we're not interested in that. Uh, that's not going to work. We're Blockbuster. We're the world's greatest, biggest company. We're not, you know, it's not going to hurt our business. Ten years later, they filed bankruptcy, and yeah. I think this is a great example to me of holding on to the status quo, that status quo biases that you're talking about. Absolutely. You're absolutely right, and this is uh, very common in many businesses. We can see uh, another example with Amazon. I mean, Amazon is the largest retailer right now, and right. other retailers that didn't follow the Amazon model are failing. Kmart failed, other businesses failed, Barnes & Nobles is in the process of failing, you know, when it's yeah. competing with Amazon in the book industry because Amazon is delivering things online. They didn't jump uh, quickly enough online, but Amazon was not the first retailer, online retailer. It's, there were plenty of other online retailers. Amazon took the time to learn from their mistakes, 
when they went first and then went in big and heavy based on their knowledge of the mistakes. So yes. that's, uh, there's quite a lot of research on, again, the benefits of learning first, kind of making small experiments or letting other people experiment for you and learning from them what works and what doesn't and then going in. So decision making, that's kind of an important principle of decision making, kind of looking what, you know, looking ahead, look, doing research, seeing what works, and figuring out what might go wrong. There's actually a famous uh, exercise, strategic exercise, in effective decision making called a pre-mortem. So not a post-mortem, which is what the Hillary campaign is doing right now. <laughs> <laughs> Like what the entire Democratic Party is doing right now. But this is called a pre-mortem. Talk about this. Right. Sure. So a pre-mortem is what businesses or any organization, you know, the Hillary Clinton campaign could have done this, do before they fail. So what they do is they have a lot of stakeholders in the organization, and I do this quite often with businesses. Uh, they have stakeholders in the organization at all levels who are involved in any project that they're about to start up, sit down and anonymously write up a series of reasons for why it might fail. So for example, the person in finances might talk about some things in the financial aspects for why it might fail. Or the person in logistics can talk about insufficient uh, suppliers or something like that for why a new project uh, product launch might fail. So they talk about why it might fail and then I, as a facilitator, or anybody else can gather, who is serving as a facilitator, can gather up all the notes from everyone who did it anonymously, and then read them out loud and have them be talked about with all the stakeholders in the room. So that uh, removes a lot of the problems of typically accompanied decision making. We talked about, you talked about people not wanting to look foolish. Because right. they are writing down things anonymously, they don't need to care about looking foolish, right? Because nobody knows who actually wrote down the thing. And they don't have to care about criticizing the big boss, uh, the CEO. Yeah. You know, if uh, somebody says something, you know, I'm worried that this project will fail because I'm not sure our CEO is good enough at relationship building with uh, some of our new strategic partners in China, that's something someone can say and something they, never, they could never say to the CEO's face, you know, or unless it's a really tolerant CEO, <laughs> let's say that. Right, right. <laughs> so right, a really can, tolerant CEO like Donald Trump, right? <laughs> oh, yes, yes, of course, of course. As we saw from his uh, treatment of his attorney general <laughs> or yeah, the yeah. Uh, who he just fired, the acting attorney general. Right, exactly. So, like the Celebrity Apprentice. No. Yes. yes. <laughs> you like, don't do yes. that to Donald Trump. Um, so, with these sorts of things, it prevents phenomena like groupthink, which is a common way that groups make really bad decisions, which is simply people agreeing with each other and saying, yes, I agree with what you're saying. It sounds good because they don't want to be offensive toward each other. Right. So, by that that way, and you also don't know who the idea is coming from, one of the important aspects of research on wise decision making and effective decision making shows that people tend to overestimate ideas that come from people with power and underestimate ideas that come from people who don't have power. Mm. So if you have, and regard, regardless of the validity of the idea of how silly right, right. it is, so if you have that anonymous process, and you know, just talking about each idea in turn, you don't know who the idea came from. It could have come from the lowly clerk or the CEO. So therefore, that allows you a lot of freedom to actually discuss and consider the ideas separately of their originator. And so that removes a lot of the common biases that accompany these problems, and it allows you to address the problems in advance that might crop up. You know, Clinton could have addressed, you know, if we're talk, talking about Clinton, could have addressed the possibility that the, uh, the Democrats, uh, the, their traditional Rust Belt strongholds would fail or something like that. So they right. could have addressed these things in advance 
and so can businesses. You know, Blockbuster could have addressed in advance the possibility that, well, maybe it would be good to invest in this new online thing too. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Dr. Sapersky, we're out of time. It's been a pleasure having you on the show talking about the science of decision-making. Love to have you back again and talk more. Uh, again, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. It was really a pleasure, Bert. And for folks who want to check out my work, you can go to globsapursky.com uh, and intentionalinsights.org. That's the website of the nonprofit that I run. Or you can email me at gleb at intentionalinsights.org. I'd be happy to send anyone who says they heard me on Money for Lunch a free copy of my decision-making guide for business. I love it. I love it. Uh, good stuff there, uh, Dr. Gleb Sapersky. Thank you so much. Uh, really, really enjoyed this conversation uh, with Dr. Gleb Sapersky, um, and I want to give out his email one more time in case you want to reach out to him, get that free guide to making a good decision or the free decision guide or whatever it's called. It's Gleb, G-L-E-B, at intentionalinsights.org, intentionalinsights.org, and um, uh, he'll send you out that free report. I think it's a great, great way to connect and get 